Hello, everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. I'm Drew Palambella, Senior Marketing Manager for Depew Synthes. Thank you all for joining us today for our first live virtual broadcast of the Depew Synthes Spy Intelligence System in Miami, Florida. We have over 500 people on the line today from the U.S. and many countries around the world. A huge thank you to the Avail team for our partnership and their technology for making this broadcast possible. We are very excited to have with us today, Dr. Michael Wang from the University of Miami and Dr. Richard Fessler from Rush University will be walking us through the ViewLift T procedure with Telogen. For those of you joining us today, we have many, I'm gonna have many questions for Dr. Wang or Dr. Fessler. Please submit those questions through our Q&A section below and we will try our best to answer them as many as possible. So with that, I'm going to hand it off to Dr. Wang and Dr. Fessler to start the demonstration. Thank you, Drew. Uh, fantastic to be here in Miami. Rick, looking forward to this. So, uh, Rick, what kind of procedure do you want to be doing today? Today we're going to be doing T-lift. At least we're going to be doing the interbody portion. We're probably not going to be putting in all the screws and, and the rods. The, the idea is really to demonstrate telogen, not how to do uh, rods and screws. So t tell me, Mike, why are we calling this a live demonstration when we're working on a cadaver? <laughs> I guess we're live with our audience. So we're going to have feedback. So please, I'm just going to reiterate what Drew said, which is send in any questions so we can answer you live. Rick has got so much expertise in this. Uh, it's really, it would be a shame not to hear his thoughts. So um, Rick, do you want to start to walk through how you like to do this procedure? And uh, we'll have the fluoroscope please come in first yeah, as well. Let's bring, the, let's bring the fluoroscope in. So you can put your first screw in, which is going to be the basis of your retractor through image guidance or traditionally using fluoroscopy. Today we're going to be doing fluoroscopy. So we're going to be putting the first screw, the basis of our retractor, on the contralateral side. So you have a choice of either putting it in the pedicle immediately adjacent to the disc space you're going to be working on or the one above that. So the inferior vertebral body or the superior vertebral body. I prefer the superior vertebral body because then it's just a little bit further away. Gives me a little more working room. So let's have a shot. And another. Okay, so that's contralateral shot. I'm gonna probably put my tip right over the pedicle. Shot. So that's pretty good. Now, scalpel, please. Yep, yep. That's nice. You can give him that one. Just for now, just for now. Yeah, right there. Yep. That'll work fine. Go ahead and grab that off. Oops, I think I just bumped this. Let's take another shot. And one more. Shot. Okay. So we're going to make an incision here large enough to put down our tower. So just a centimeter long. And can you raise your machine just a little bit more? Shot. Okay, so you can see my tip is just a little bit high. Little mallet. Shot. Teeny bit low. One more shot. Right and there. And right there. One more time. That'll work well. Okay. And do you have a holder? Just want to make sure we're going straight down into the pedicle. Shot. That looks pretty good. Now it. I don't think I'm biting yet. Now it. There we go. This guy's bone is hard. Now let's switch to a lateral. Now, Rick, it's interesting. So you say you like to use the <coughs> cranial location. That's interesting. I, I've uh, taken a slightly different approach, which is I like. Oh, I'm put this down. I um, usually go based on the side that I'm coming from. So in other words, if I'm right-handed coming from this side, the L4 screw will be the right one, the correct one to use, because later on, I'm going to have to put an L5 screw in, so this won't be in my way. 
So I like to do whichever screw is going to be to the left of me. I see. Yeah, that way the post is out of my way. But I think the bottom line is you can put this anywhere except for the um, ipsilateral caudal pedicle, right? You know, I think we're hitting this. Let me, there we go. Correct. That's you could correct. even use the cranial pedicle uh, of the level you're at. Can we so raise this a little bit? Can you go down a little bit further? Is this raised at all? Oh, I think we're going to be good. Uh, pretty close. A little bit more down. Nope, that's it. Oh, here we go. Just going to raise the table for us. Oh, yeah. Like the real OR, right? Just like this in the real OR. Okay. And can our participants see the uh, x ray images as well? Okay, perfect, perfect. Excellent, excellent. Okay, good. Another shot. All right, now it again. Yeah, the bone must be exceptionally hard because the Viper Prime system is really good with the cutting flutes of getting through um, bone. There you go. I think it's going now. It is now. The next ray there. Good. Perfect. 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 Okay, great. So as Rick's working, I'm going to not have you have to narrate every piece. I can narrate a little for you, Rick. Is that okay? Please do. Yeah, good. So obviously these are polyaxial screws. So the yeah. next step in building our retractor system is to take away the polyaxiality of it, which is going to be this blocking uh, technique, which is going to be placed inside the screw. And you can set it however you want inside the polyaxial head. And what Dr. Fesser is doing, as you can see, he's tightening this on to this to the screw post, the tower, if you will. And you can see he has a counter torque in his left hand because you don't want to spin and loosen that screw. So now it's solid. You see, that's very rigid. Yeah, excellent, excellent. And that's going to be the base. So this um, patient-mounted retractor system is very valuable, right? Because it's better than table-mounted, I think. Absolutely. Now, for the to begin the procedure, so now we've got the basis of our retractor in place. So now we're going to begin our dilation. Uh, toward our disc level. And we'll do, I do this in the lateral position. I make my incision usually two to two and a half centimeters off midline, so I'm pretty much roughly right over the disc. Oops, shot. Shot. There we go. That's pretty good. And midline is there, so perhaps a little bit more off. Right about there. Okay. First dilator. Now we should add that in the description of the oh, hang on. view lift procedure, um, the dilator actually comes with an integrated neuro monitoring system. Uh, so you can actually use a neuro monitoring probe if you're going to go through or in a proximity of the Camden Shot. triangle. And that will allow you to uh, use the electrophysiologic um, safety, Shot. if you will, of knowing where that exiting nerve root is. Now, Rick, you're taking Shot. a more medial, almost more like a translaminar approach, right? Pretty so, much, yep. Yeah, so that's not really needed. Um, but if I were to come from a more lateral position and medialize, I could use that to get right into the disc around the facet joint more safely. Okay. Okay, shot. So you can see that we're, we're dilating right down onto the disc space. Um, now, here's one uh, step I've learned is it's important to look at your depth on your largest dilator because you want to match that on our, on our actual retractor. You can see the retractor on fluoroscopy, but it's very faint shot. So you can kind of see. Mike, can you point yeah. out where the retractor is? What you're is? looking at here, and, and it's the shadow. I can't really show you on because you're getting the direct x-ray image, but you see the shadow, and you can see that Dr. Fesser is docked all the way down to that second, not the smallest retractor, because you see that window. It's like a rectangle. Uh, where you can see the air, right? You can see that shadow, yep. and so that's nice. That's a so we got a pretty deep. good dilation, yep. Yeah. Um, right. And now, um, let's go ahead and put our holder on. Can I see one of those? Do you have one of those available to me? So I can show as well. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, and then the other. <coughs> okay. Now let's put our. So this is our, I think you can see this good. This is what our retractor actually is, okay? Now underneath here, we've got a ball. 
and that ball is going to get hooked up right onto here and then this gets hooked onto here Loosen it up on your screw now I'll just point this out Dr. Fessler you chose to to pick the flat port head not the angled right Correct. Yeah, so I like the angled port head. I, I take a slightly different approach. I come from lateral to medial, so this angled port head would go in like this, right, into the patient like this. Um, and also another feature of this is you'll notice that this, this port, there's two of them, comes with this port holder. So this is going to attach to the arm, and there's a unidirectionality to it. You can hear it here. Okay, and that means it won't back out this way unless you squeeze these flanges. This is very important so you don't have the port backing out against you. It always pushes in this direction towards the, the ground or towards the spine. Right, so again, you can go this way, but you can't go the other way unless you push on the flanges. Now, the reason, now you can see that this is very firmly attached. And it's not going to move unless we loosen this up and want to move it, which we can do. And we even have an instrument to help us to do that. Now, in order to take it out, I just grab this, and it takes out both of those retractors, and then I bring those out. The reason I prefer the flat rather than the flanged is because I prefer to work with my camera at 12 o'clock, and this other tube is designed really to work with your tube to work at um, six o'clock. At six o'clock. Yeah. At times, I will move my camera to so I can see different places, and I find that the, the flat one allows less creep when I do that. So if I've got my flange here and I turn it this way, I get creep coming in from over here. So that's why I prefer the flat. Yeah, no, and I notice you've set up now already to start with the camera at 9 o'clock, meaning the camera's medial. I tend to start with my camera lateral, which is 6 o'clock. Yep. As, as we're standing. So this is 12 o'clock. 12 o'clock. Right. I'm sorry, six, yeah, 12 o'clock. I, I start at 6 o'clock, yeah. Now. One of the neat things about this too is that in the, in the old, those of you who remember the old endoscopic systems, we had just a dedicated tube. So if you had a really fat patient, you couldn't get it all the way down to the bottom without making a bigger incision and pushing it in. And if you had a really skinny patient that you really only needed three centimeters, you were stuck with a seven centimeter tube. This tube, we can cut to the exact length that we need. Now we recommend giving yourself one or two millimeters of, of leeway because you might moving it around a little bit. So to cut it, you push that in and squeeze this and it cuts it off to the exact length that you want. All right, how about our camera? Right. Who's gonna give me the camera? Yeah, I'll give you the camera. So here's, can you guys see that, you wanna show the Telogen Tower just real quick over here? Bring that camera up so we can see it. So this is your tower system. You can see what Dr. Fessler is going to be looking at. This is the monitor up here. Uh, it's a it's an HD monitor. Uh, it's huge, and he gets a wonderful view. You can see that I'm already looking around with the Telogen camera. I'm looking now uh, at myself, right? Uh, I can look around the world with this, and the um, tower will have this apparatus, which is for the visual monitoring. It will have the clearance system and a suction below. So Rick, I'm going to give this over to you. Let's put a little slack on there. So Mike already demonstrated that this has an automatic washer. So you don't have to take it out and wipe it off and put it back in. You just step on the washer and it washes it automatically for you. And in a second, you're gonna see the bottom of the tube. This actually holds the tube out of your way. And let's go now with Bobby. One of the tricks, of, you know, one of the, the nice thing about it is all you see is the tips of your instruments. What that means is sometimes you get your instruments crossed and you're fighting outside of your visual field and you don't realize that. So one of the tricks to working on this kind of endoscopy is to work with your instruments in parallel uh, all the time. We need to switch the camera to 12, please. Great. Okay, so here's 12. This is medial, lateral, caudal, cephalad. And what you just saw there was important because this is a digital system so it allows you to actually change the orientation um, of view. And this is important because some people like to work uh, at a particular direction. In this case, Dr. Fessler has the camera at 12 o'clock meaning medial. Uh, and sometimes you'll change in the middle of a surgery. You'll go from 12 to let's say nine or three or six just to see around a corner. There you go. And Dr. Fester is just clearing off some of the soft tissue here. Okay, we we'll step on our form. So you please. can see there, there's some, some obstruction of view from the bovie smoke. 
And what you're seeing here is the cleaning, the automated lens cleaning system. You see the, the flush of irrigation, which he suctions out. But more importantly, there's a, there's a back end, uh, if you will, uh, CO2 that helps to wash away any meniscus or any kind of distorting effects that the liquid on the top okay, of the lens step again, please. All right, you can have a pituitary. Pituitary. Pituitary? Yes. Right there, yep. Good, I, I, better, I find better that one? this uh, tissue better. clearance better. step is critical. You have to always get off a little bit of the muscular cuff or some fat uh, that is in the way in terms of, of what you can see until you get down to the bone. In this case, I think Dr. Fesser is going to end up looking at the lamina and maybe a little bit of the set joint. Uh, so he gets a good view of where he's going to be going through. Um, you can also see that Dr. Fessler can adjust the altitude of his camera. He can push it in a little further to get closer to the area of interest, uh, resulting in not only magnification, but also maybe a little bit better, better resolution versus coming out a bit and um, having a wider field of view. And so you're going to want to change this at various times. When you're working with your booby, I recommend keeping your camera high. But as soon as you're getting down to working around the dura, maybe doing your laminotomy and facetectomy, then you can lower it down for a, a little bit better magnification. By keeping it high during this stage, you don't, you don't make your, lens, your cameras dirty. Yeah, and so we can see an excellent delineation that uh, Dr. Fesser is seeing now of the bone, the lamina, some of the facet joint right there and really draw your attention to the high visual quality that you can actually really appreciate what's going on if I think back to those MED systems that we had 20 years ago uh, the resolution uh, just it just wasn't as high and it made it kind of hard to see um, what you're looking at sometimes obviously we don't have stereoscopic or 3d view but it's compensated for by the high definition quality of the visualization here that's a very nice uh, dissection of that soft tissue cuff right there. So let me have now the uh, handle to change the angle. Yep. So I'm going to make this a little bit more medial than we are right now. So I think you can see what we're doing there, OK? And I want to go a little more medial. Can I have a floral, please? OK, we're still there looking is. pretty good. You can see the shadow. You see some of the internal electronic components of his camera there as well. Good. And one of the things I really like about this as opposed to working Wash, channel endoscopy is that there just really isn't that disorientation because you always know which side is medial, which side is cranial, which side is lateral, and which side is caudal. So you really see that meniscus and it washed away the air. Wash again, please. There we go. One of the real positives here is that the, um, the tools that you use for this surgery, they can just be the standard instruments that you're accustomed to. And we're going to see that soon when the drilling starts and the, the Harrison punches are brought out. So this is the medial edge of the facet right here. We're going down to the lamina, which is down below here. I think this guy's already had a laminotomy. That's his dura. So we're actually looking. We're looking at dura here already. So now you can you can drill up whatever you want to do. You can remove the set in, in whatever way you're comfortable with. Um, you can do it by defining the lamina using a kerosene punch. 
uh, and then you can use osteotomes or you can drill it off, uh, what, whatever, whatever technique you prefer. We have an angled curette, please. Medium sized. That's good. Perfect. So let's actually have one a little bit smaller. Uh, this one. So this is the, the, lem the plane between the dura and what's left of the facet. Um, so let's try an osteotome. Okay, and where's that mallet? Okay, fluoro. Now, Rick, tell us about these landmarks you're using for these cuts. So when I use an osteotome, I want to put it right on the bottom of the pedicle above, and I want to put it on the top of the pedicle below. So, shot. And the reason for that is, if, if I should happen to plunge, shot, it's going to slide right down along the edge of the pedicle, and it's not going to cut the nerve root. Shot. 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 Like that. And then shot. Up here, shot. 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 There we go, shot. And that's about where I want to stop. I like to get about a millimeter or two from the bottom, and then I just twist it in order to loosen it up a little bit. And now, now I need a, a heavy pituitary. Is this that a looks like the biggest one. That's the biggest. Do. I'll try not to break this. For this step, I have an extremely large pituitary that just grabs the whole thing and breaks it off. This is doing a pretty good job. So that's, you're cutting away essentially the inferior articular process, right? The IAP? Correct. Sets? Okay. Now for this, I'm going to take the camera out so I don't goop it all up. But you could save this for bone grafting later, right? That's exactly why I use that. And we'll put this back in. And now let's take a look at what we've got. This is ligament. And I'm going to clear the soft tissue up a little bit here. Now, we're doing a T lift here. In a decompression, of course, you wouldn't take so much bone, right? You'd be drilling instead? Correct. So I'm using this now for all of my T lifts, all of my lumbar stenosis, and all of my discs. So I'm doing virtually most of my lumbar surgery now using Telogen. Mm -hmm. Your docking and your approach is similar for those steps for the decompressions? Yes. All right, will you step on the washer for me, please? Great. Now, Kerrison, please. Um, that'd be good. And again, I want to draw your attention to the fact that Dr. Fessler is using instruments that are just standard. They're not bayoneted. They don't have to have any special features. These are your typical Kerrison's that you would use in any operating room, which is a nice uh, feature about Telogen. You don't have to use anything too specialized. I'll point out also that unlike my operating room, these kerosens actually bite. <laughs> They're still sharp, huh? Yeah. So one of the keys also to doing endoscopic surgery with this kind of endoscope is use the tip of your instrument as part of your probe. So you don't have three-dimensionality, 
So feel the bone, slide down the bone, and then slide underneath what you want to bite. Yeah, it's interesting. So when you do this type of um, procedure on a cadaver, it looks quite different than in uh, real life. I would tell you that I think the contrast and the tissue textures and all that is much better in real life. Wouldn't you agree, Rick? Yeah, I mean, everything looks pretty much the same here. Um, but in, in, a, in, a, when in an actual operation, you know, you have much more red, obviously, from bleeding, uh, and that helps you. And your tissues... Uh, are more distinct. One of the keys, oh, we've got some ligament here, let's take it out. One of the keys also to endoscopic surgery is finish your operation at the anatomic level you're working on before you go to the next. In other words, do your complete laminotomy first and then remove, uh, before you even get there, make sure that you've removed all the soft tissue all the way out to the edges of your tube because it can be difficult to distinguish one plane from another and in particularly in a cadaver because they're all looking the same. But if you get your soft tissue completely out from level one, that is your fat and your muscle, before you do your laminotomy and before, especially before you get down to your ligament, it makes defining your anatomy much easier. So while we're doing this, let me have one of the engineers come up here and show how we make adjustments to hue and contrast. Let's zoom out a little bit, pan out a little bit, and show how we have the ability to manipulate uh, some of the imaging. So why don't you bring that up? Yeah, so let's go to the extremes of enhancement and, and whatnot. Uh, we want to see the split screen, please. Split screen so that we can see the actual... Where's... There you go. Okay, good. Perfect, perfect. Yeah, good. So go to the extreme of enhancement. Okay, and in, and you see that you start to see the glare now go all the way to the other end. Now, it's not going to show up as well in this cadaver, right? But this is your ability to manipulate the imaging uh, to your liking. Okay, so put that back to where it was, and then let's do the exposure. Let's go all the way to the extreme exposure. See that? Okay, and all the way back to the other end. These are the extremes we're showing you, just to give you an idea of how you can change the world that you see. Put the exposure back to baseline again. Let's now do brightness, which is different from exposure. That looked like it was brightness, but it wasn't. And make, make it hard on Rick here to change the imaging as he's working, right? But he's a master. So, And then the other end, brightness all the way on the other end, right? Go back, and that's the light brightness. And finally, the zoom. Let's go up on zoom. Yeah, all the way to, yep. And then back down all the way to the bottom. Good, okay? And among all of that also, you can push your camera in deeper. Exactly and you can pull it out farther, okay? So right now we're not worried about splash so much, so I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go in fairly deep. And you know, I find that this is something that takes a little getting used to. I think the neurosurgeons who do endoscopic pituitaries or have tried that before will understand this, that this type of camera has a great deal of perspective on it. What that means is, it needs a new sucker tip, please. Do we have another um, sucker tip? Which means that as you get further away from the camera, ahead, everything looks that one out. Great. smaller Great. and smaller. And you'll see that on the suctions and the instruments that as you go away from you, and I know Rick is very used to this, it, gets, it, it looks like it's smaller. It's not a cylinder. It looks like a cone. And so it's very important to realize that although sometimes it looks like you may say, well, it looks like Dr. Fessler didn't take a lot of bone off. The reality is a tremendous amount of bone has already been removed uh, through those osteotome cuts. And you can use the drill as well. Um, so it's important to understand perspective because it's different than under the microscope, right, Rick? It looks different. Yeah, yeah you really, you, you actually do remove quite a lot. And I can tell you an anecdote of that, oops, that happened to me years ago. I was training one of my fellows and uh, he, was, he was complaining. He said, you know, I'm just, I'm just not, I just can't expose everything I need to expose. And I said, uh, well, so-and-so, all you need to do is change the angle of your tube. Yeah. And he said, Oh, you can move the tube? <laughs> so actually, exactly. let's drill off a little bit of the facet here. Get that again, huh? I'm going to step on the uh, washer again, please.
There we go. It's important to have your sucker in the tube when you're washing it, and you just saw why, because when you, if, if, if you don't suck out the water before you get that second phase of blowing air, it won't clean it off for you. I'm going to give us a little more room. So now we've got the medial part exposed as much as we need. You can see a lot of the dura there. I'm going to give, our, give ourselves a little more room here to drill off more of the facet. Like any tips on clearing the soft tissue? I find that that's one of the biggest difficulties is that there's a cuff of soft tissue in your way. I notice you use the bobe. Do you have any other tips besides that? Yeah, well, and on the bobe, use the, um, the coag rather than cut. And the reason for that is cut will be faster, but it will also cut the vein or the artery, and it, it'll then retract underneath mm, the tube, please. and you can't get to it whereas your coag will coagulate it and not cut it. So I think that's an important tip. Good, and you're just trying to get around the outside of the dura by taking this facet, right? So that yep. you can retract it? Exactly, so I don't have to retract the dura very much. All right, would you wash, please? Great. All right, now our drill. And are you okay? All righty. Uh, let's see. On. One of the other tips about drilling through a tube is that you've got to drill the proximal stuff before you can go deep because you can't you're, you're drilling straight down you, you don't really have the ability to angle your tube your drill very much so you've got to drill proximal before you can go deep is this this is not the drill that you use either right use this, the am8 i use an am8 and i use it i use it shielded um go ahead and uh wash please Yeah, I like your, your trick with the shielded AM8 or the matchstick burr. Um, that's my preference to not this kind of a ball. Uh, it just doesn't seem as accurate. Okay, uh, drill on. Off. Let's see if we have enough. It's very interesting. So, Rick, you do almost all the work with the nine o'clock position. The, I'm sorry, the twelve o'clock position the whole time. Yep, I do. You don't turn it. You don't change. Not very it. often. Well, there, like for example, when I'm doing a disc. Um, I really want to be working medially, and when I put my retractor in, the camera's in the way. So then I will move it to 3 or 9 o'clock, depending on what I want to see more, so that I can use the retractor. And we'll, we'll put the retractor in here in a few minutes. Now, one of the very interesting features of Telogen, because this is a truly revolutionary um, technology, it's, it's all new, right? All these elements of how we do things uh, in terms of the visualization, what we see, and all that will be, uh, will be new to surgeons and I think an improvement. But one of the very interesting things that I noticed when we first started doing this was that when we look in the tube and we see the movement. So in other words, a lot of folks watching at home or in their offices may think that, wow, look at the instability there. As, as Dr. Fessler is taking off bone, it looks like the whole spine is unstable, it's moving around. But we, we quickly figured out that that's not the case at all, that it's a frame of reference. So what's happening is that the, the tube is moving, and so the camera is moving, so it looks like the spine is moving. It's relative. So um, just be aware that that's going to be something you're going to see um, when you use this kind of system. So it's very easy to say, wow, wow, look at that. It's like so unstable. The set pieces are all mobile. 
and it's not that at all. It's that your perspective on the spine will be altered by uh, very small deflections in the position of your camera. All right, so this is all disc here. And there, here's exiting nerve root right there. So we're in the axilla. And now may I have the retractor? Do you want to wash it real quick? Let's wash it so it becomes a little bit more clear to Wait. see. Let me get the sucker in here. Yeah. A little bit of bone there. Okay. So for anatomy, here's the lateral edge of the dura. This is the pedicle coming out into the foramen here. There you can see the medial edge of the exiting nerve root. And this is our disc right here. So Dr. Fester is now putting in a nerve shield that's a self-retaining uh, retractor, if you will. And you can see his technique, excellent. He spins it around. He's going to spin it. And now if he puts it medial, oh, you're going to, oh, I see, that's clever. You're going to put it at about 2 o'clock. So now I can still see it yeah. hasn't obstructed my camera. Yeah. I've got my entire disc space exposed here. And let's start our discectomy. Right. You want to fold that nerve shield back a little bit so you can oh. now fold this out of your way so there's no profile. It doesn't get in your way. Perfect. And you can see Dr. Fesser doesn't need, he never needs an assistant, but now especially uh, he does not nice. need someone else to hold the dura out of the way, if you will. And I, you see how he's done it. He doesn't completely protect it. He uses it as a kind of deflector. So the uh, shield is oriented caudally. Well, that's is that too big a knife. This is a, this is a big, big uh, knife. Yeah. Okay, pituitary. There we go. You have a smaller pituitary for him? Maybe that's too big. Yeah, that's good. Give him that one, yeah. And then we're going to use this thing right away. Okay, so we're in the disk space now. So before I take too much out, we're going to use an instrument that is a, sort of a fast removal system. And let's hook, up, hook that up to uh, suction. We call this the clear, right? It used to be called Concord Clear. Now it's clear. It's an automated uh, instrument for cartilage removal. Really nice because you don't have to pass by that nerve root uh, except once. So Dr. Fester, you can see the short stroking motion he's using. He's turning his hand to catch the end plate cartilage, but it should not go through the bone so long as there's not a lot of force. You want to get an x-ray there real quick? Take a look. You can see it inside the disc and it's somewhat angled. Uh, and Dr. Fester's going medial here, cleaning out disc material. And you can see inside here now that we're collecting disc inside the tube. Yeah, and you see one pass basically through the, the, uh, the space where the nerves live means that there's a much lower rate of CSF leakage. You see the nerve shield there working to uh, deflect the traversing nerve root uh, more medial. And then you see the exiting nerve root very nicely above. Now, again, I use a different technique, which is uh, more transforaminal from outside in. So it would look a little different from this, but this is an excellent demonstration of how a key lift can be done very efficiently. And then it's important, I'm controlling the suction with my finger right here. You can see there's a port right here. So when, I'm, when I want to suck out disc, I close it up and it sucks. When I want to put it in or out, I take my finger off. It's interesting because folks can spend a lot of time on disc prep, right? It can be a very laborious, uh, time-consuming process. I think uh, Johnson Johnson had done a study years ago showing that removing the disc and getting a end plate preparation is one of the most laborious and time-consuming tasks uh, for inner body fusion. 
And then the most important, quite honestly. Yeah, right, to get a fusion, right? Get a solid fusion. Good, good. Excellent. All right, so we've got a pretty good discectomy now. So let's go ahead and uh, introduce our biologics. So hey, by way of demonstration, if we could pull up, uh, here I can put my gloves on and show. Meanwhile, while you're operating, your scrub tech has hopefully been diligently dealing with the grafting preparation process. No, my scrub tech's listening to music. <laughs> Let's go here. Do you have the little paddle and you have fiber graft? Good. You want to open that up for me? And there's a little, uh, yeah, there's a little paddle. There's a little, little plastic device. Yeah, there we go. Thank you. And then what we can see here is while you can see Dr. Fesser doing that, I'll be doing some of this. And this is the setup. So again, these preloaded uh, ready to preload tubes allow you to fill uh, whatever kind of graft you want that's going to be inserted into this up angle curet device. This is one of the most taxing uh, problems for scrub techs is they have to do all this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, this is Vivigen matrix. This is a cellular product, okay? And you can see I'm just putting it however I want there. And I'm going to use this little spatula and deliver the graft. It's got a downward slope, right? So it's very easy to just push the graft into this space, okay? Filling however much I want. I can move it up to here, get to the top of it. I don't want to overfill because I don't want to log jam it. Okay, very easy to use. Oh, very easy to use. Just like that, okay? Very quick, very fast, no need to cut syringes and all that, right? You can see that all loaded up. And then I'm going to pull this out, and it's ready. It's it's our. You can you can zoom out. It's preloaded and ready to go. Dr. Fessler is then going to use. This is almost like a cage trial, but he's going to insert and he's going to rotate it, and it's going to allow us to place this graft with directionality, meaning the directionality will be towards the um, medial and lateral aspects around whatever cage you use, and you can see these holes where the graft will be coming out of on either side, right? And that's gonna pass through here with a plunger, okay? Okay, so let's Great. go ahead and there put go, that right. in. I have the other one, do you have a second one? Okay, and then we turn it and we're ready to deliver. And plunger. Do you have a mallet? Yeah, there we go, yeah, there we go. And so what you're going to see is this is, yeah, there you go. And see how easily that graft is delivered. How about a shot? Now, uh, you're pushing medially, right? So that's graft that's going towards the medial side. Correct. And then we're going to pull this out. And then I can read, normally it comes with two, it does come with two of these. And I'm going to put this back in. You'll see how quickly you can load. You don't even have to take this step because there's normally two of them. And this will go to the, and I don't even do this for a living, so the fact that I can get this, I can do it, anybody can do it, right? You're a pretty good scrub tech, Mike. I know, right? It's like, you want a job? I know, right? I'll come to Chicago, but not in the winter. <laughs> okay, that's kind of like that. Get it out okay. of there. Okay, good. So this is going to go, Rich, you're going to put this in laterally, right? Yep. And then I'll give you the plunger. Turn it around. I'm going to do it the other direction. Plunger. Plunger. And it's got holes on both sides, so you can just leave it the way it was, and then and it's in. The graph right. is in. Not only that, there's a space that's there for the cage. So um, the cage. So you can see how it comes out right there. Yeah. Dude, both ends of it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, okay. Do we have a cage a cage trial. And here we're going to use. Uh, what about, we have the minimally invasive one too. Let's show them that. Oh, yes, the Vivigen MIS. Yeah, yeah, let's take a look at that. So this is another way of delivering your bone. It's called the Vivigen MIS system. So this will go directly down. And we would go right into our disc space. And then you just pump it like a gun. Each pump delivers 0.25 cc's. So you can deliver the exact amount that you want very quickly and very easily. Great. Okay, now. You want to use X-Pack or what do you want to use for yeah. cage? Okay. Yeah. All right. You want to show the X-Pack cage? And so. How can we get up? So here we go. So this is the X 
pack cage. Oh, where do we do it? How about we do the overhead camera? I will give it to you right there and I can zoom in. Okay. Okay, there we go. So this is the XPAC cage and it expands. As you can see, it's an expandable cage. So you go in with it unexpanded, of course. And lordotically expanding, okay. Here we see it passing through. You want to go back to the other view as well? And I'll take the. Uh, give, give him one second to go back. Go back. There we go. Good. Yeah. And, and you can see now the nerve shield at work. Okay. All right. Okay. Shot. A little bit more, huh? Shot. Great. So we're in far enough now. And now we can expand it. Can we show the x ray up there as well, Avail? And you can see it beginning to expand. There we there. go. A little too zoomed in, but yeah. Take another x ray. Shot. And there you can see we're expanded. We're oh, in it's... good position. Oh, there we go. Yes. There it is. Excellent. Good. Okay. Perfect. And now we want to, you guys want me to remove it? Take yeah, the... yeah. So we're going to remove it now because we don't want to have a. Because people have to do this, and you can't leave it in a cadaver, so we're going to take it out now. Shot. That's right. Okay, we're not Perfect. expanded. We can take this out. Good. Great. Perfect. Perfect. So, now, go ahead. Rick, why don't you show them the different views? So we can take the nurse shield out. Because you've been working at 12 the whole time, right? That's so right. So let's take them on a little tour. I'll bring the uh, engineers up here again to show you what it looks like. So Dr. Fester has been looking from... 12 from medial to lateral, right? And so now, this is what you could, so remember, I mean, this camera gives you, I can't remember, it's a 170 degree angle that you can see, 70 degree. So you're not just seeing what's inside the tube, you're actually seeing outside the tube. So you see more with this camera than you see with a microscope. I just put the second for reference for people so they can see uh, where. And let me. Get that out of the way. Get that out of there. The graph or something. Can I just flush it? Flush it? Yeah, Rick, if you put your, uh, put it in an axilla maybe, or in a disk space. Okay, so right now we're in the axilla. Okay. And now I'm going to turn the tube to 6 o'clock. Okay. You see how different everything looks. And then now we're going to flip the digital image, so now it will be still properly referenced. Yep, so now we're still in the axilla. But you can see now we see much we see much more underneath the dura than we did at 12 o'clock. And let's go to, let's Here, go here's, to our, here's our annulotomy right there. And then let's go to like 9 or 3. Let's, let's take Okay, so three. here's 3. Okay. Switch that, and you can see at the bottom right-hand corner of what they're doing is they're shifting. It shows you constantly where your camera is. And they, Rick, if you put your sucker back in just to keep the people referenced where so they now, are. So here's Axela, and you can see how much more of this we're seeing now that we didn't see right. before. And then if we go around to lift this up to nine o'clock. Here's the Axela here. And now you can see how much more we're seeing down here. So then depending upon where you want to work and what you want to, and what you want to see, you just move your camera. And you always change your orientation so that lateral is always lateral, medial is always medial, caudal is always caudal, and cephalad is always cephalad. Yeah, for example, you and I are both right-handed. So if we're working from the, this is a left-sided approach, um, if the sucker is in my left hand, it is always in front of the camera, then it's going to block me. All I got to do is go to the other side and look from the other side, right? And reset right. it, right? Yep. Yeah. Does anybody have any questions? Super, super efficient. Yes. Hey, Dr. Wang, it's Lindsay Kamara. So we have uh, two questions that have come through the chat so far. Sure. So the first question is, Dr. Wang and Dr. Fessler, can you speak to the difference of having assured visualization at the anatomy and not above it outside the wound? Why don't you, you want to take it first? I didn't hear Oh, okay. So what the, I believe what the question is, and correct me if I'm wrong, is because the camera is deep, 
we've never had a chance to look from that view. We've always had to get light in and light out. So I'll, I'll give you my perspective on it. Not having to get light in and out of the tube, meaning all that's happening down deep, all the action for, for visualization is happening deep, means I don't need to use bayoneted instruments. I don't worry about instruments being in the way unless it's right in front of the camera. It means the working space is all for tools. In other words, normally through a tube, if you block your light in or out, you can't see, right? And you need to get so much light in and so much light out. So this minimizes interference with that. So that's super helpful um, in that regard. So I never have to use a headlight. Um, when I'm teaching my residents uh, prior to this system, I would wear a headlight with a camera on it and they would wear a headlight with a camera. So I needed to see what they were doing and, and in order to teach them, they needed to see what I was doing. And then of course, I'm always looking straight down. So my neck is bent for however long the operation takes. Uh, here, I don't have to do that. I can clearly see what they're doing. They can see what I'm doing. And I'm just standing naturally looking at my camera, at my screen. And I also don't have a microscope where my, where my instrument is constantly bumping into the microscope when I go in and out. Uh, so it's a very uh, technically easy way to do an operation. So Dr. Fessler and Dr. Wang, we do have another question on that. So how did your OR staff adjust to Telogen in the room? Uh, mine was, um, well, and Mike and I maybe have a different experience. I have been using a previous endoscopic system for many years. So my operating room was used to having that type of equipment. Um, but it's, it's been a non-issue. They adjusted to it immediately. Uh, the instruments are the same. So you're asking for your kerosene, your pituitaries. That's all the same. And there's other people that are running your endoscope for you. So they don't really have anything to do with that, except that they can see what you're doing now. And so they can anticipate the next instrument that you're going to, that you're going to need. So the transition for my OR staff was, was easy, very easy. Yeah, I would tell you some advantages now. I'm not suggesting that the other systems aren't great. So, you know, obviously I use the endoscope, microscope, and the system. So with regards to the microscope, a couple of negatives is that the scrub tech has to drape the scope. I mean, we're always sitting there waiting for them to drape. You contaminate the drape, you got to redrape. For them, they don't necessarily like that. I mean, that's a lot of work. And God forbid you're doing it at night and, and the tech doesn't know how to drape a scope. We've seen that happen before. On the endoscope side, it's similar, which is getting the um, getting the fiber optic uh, or, or cables connected through a sterile sleeve. People who don't know what they're doing cannot do that procedure. It's like passing an ultrasound probe. And then the irrigation. So this is not underwater. So with the working channel endoscopy, it's underwater. I'll tell you, you know, and I, I love the endoscope. I use it all the time. But we can burn through uh, 40 liters of irrigation a day. I'm sorry, a, a procedure. And so they're having to hang and hang and hang and watch, uh, fill it with, you know, vancomycin and epinephrine. It, it has a utility that is superior in some ways, but for the staff, this is a lot easier. Go ahead, Lindsay. Great. We have one more question from Gregory Chow. Do you distract the space to protect the exiting nerve root? I do not. I don't, I don't know about Mike. I don't. Yeah. So um, I don't know if Greg can answer this in time, but I don't know if Greg's doing like an endoscopic T-lift or transforaminal type T-lift. Uh, most people who do it the way you saw Dr. Fessler did an amazing job. This is about how many minutes was this? You guys clock it. What time is it right now? We started at two. What time is it right now? Less than 45 minutes, right? And this is with, with people that we're not familiar with. And, um, you know, so when you're, when you're doing this technique, I don't, you don't want to see necessarily much of the exiting root. It's not yeah. helpful, right? I, I rarely see it, quite honestly. But for the folks who are coming without taking much facet, you're coming more laterally. Yes, exiting root can be a problem. Uh, and so here's the advantage here. So if I'm working extra foraminally, the goal is you can see that the nerve is going to sweep laterally and caudally. The more medial I get, the less I worry about that. So that's really the power here is that you're removing facet bone in my case, it'd be SAP, not IAP, superior articular process, lateral facet, and that'll give me the clearance so I don't need to distract. But I totally get Greg Chow's question, and it's a legit one, especially if you're coming from far lateral. Thank you. That was a 10 Another blade you were using we... on the disc. Just, <laughs> just, I, I was like 15 blade. That, that gives you an idea how big it really is when it didn't look that big. Yeah, I was worried about cutting the nerve root with that. 
<laughs> Any other questions, Lindsay? Yes. So Great. from well, a learning Friday, curve perspective, okay. from a learning curve perspective, does visualization help level the field to get to proficiency with MIS? Can you speak on how the residents and fellows have adopted it in your operating room? So um, I work with both fellows and residents um, and their, rap, their ability to adopt it depends upon their previous surgical skill. I have one fellow who uh, has extensive hands-on experience and one fellow who has less. Uh, the one with extensive experience was able to adopt this very quickly and the one with less is actually doing great, much better than I anticipated that he would. Um, my, uh, my residents uh, that have adopted it um, have done minimally invasive with me their entire residency. So for them, it's just adapting to a camera rather than looking down a tube directly. And they are doing a great job with it. Yeah, I, I would actually go as far as to say, I think, uh, although experience always matters, right? It might even be easier for residents and fellows to do this than experienced surgeons in the sense that experienced surgeons are so accustomed to doing things the way they do it that uh, sometimes that can be a hindrance. And because the perspective here is different, it is, it is in many ways superior, but in many ways it is a departure from what people are used to seeing. So as I was indicating, when you have perspective, like you're doing endoscopic pituitary, when you're looking far away, that stuff doesn't look as big as it really is. And it takes an ability, if you've done endoscopic pituitaries, you're, you know this, it looks like you're working through a tiny space at times. I think the residents and fellows are gonna learn this better than someone who's so inculcated with the idea that this is how things look under the microscope, under the endoscope or with loops. Um, so I would tell you that, you know, learn it early, right? Like yeah, get get yeah. good at it early. I mean, remember back when you were learning how to operate from your mentors. I mean, you went into the operation with the mindset that this is the way to do it. And you did everything you needed to do to learn how to do it that way. That's the way our residents are approaching this now. They're coming into this and saying, oh, this is the way it's going to be done. Yeah. And they're learning it. And I would add, you know, Rick, you know, we, you and I have been on this journey with a, a, a couple other icons in MIS surgery, that this is, this is the stepping stone. This is the first of a lot of stuff that is planned to make surgery way better. We are taking this mid step so that adoption will be easy. Adoption will be straightforward. Adoption will be um, without difficulty. But, but this is going to be a necessary stepping stone to get to what you and I do, which is really ultra minimally invasive surgery, right? Yeah. So yeah, we've both been doing minimally invasive surgery our entire career, basically. And I'll, I'll tell you, this is really cool. <laughs> this is really cool. But you know what? We should turn this back over to Drew because Drew does have a way for folks to connect, uh, right? If you want to, yeah, maybe you can mention some of the exciting programs. This is a big deal. This is, I, I want to say this, it hasn't been this exciting since 04 when J&J uh, &J, uh, and uh, had, had launched brand new technology and tubes were coming out and EMPs and all this stuff. I mean, this is the beginning of digital spine surgery, I think. So um, it's, it's, a, it's a journey. So Drew, you want to talk, talk about some of the programs j, &J is Absolutely, offering? absolutely. First, Dr. Wang, Dr. Fessler, thank you both so much uh, for going through this demonstration. Truly appreciate everything you do and your partnership with us. So as far as the education front, I mean, Radek and, and she walks back in, she can definitely help me with this. But um, we have several courses, uh, both national courses, and we're also doing um, a lot of hands-on into our society meetings as well. So all the, all the major society meetings that are happening throughout 2023, um, we're going to be having, uh, we're going to be having Telogen at those society meetings. But also you just saw an amazing technology that we partner with Avail. Um, this is something that we can have a very uh, virtual where you can, uh, your customers can experience Intelligent um, in, an, in their own setting, whether it's home, whether it's in the office, um, and they can see the surgery and ask questions directly to these surgeons that are doing the, uh, doing the case. Almost, also, we have a program where you can have almost a consult with, uh, with the experts where you can uh, set that up. Um, our professional education team um, can, can send out any information related to that where you can set up a one-on-one -on -one chat basically with the surgeons that have done cases. So there's, as you can see, there's a lot of an amazing opportunities for, for the education front to really help to help drive this technology and really show the true value of enhanced uh, visualization with the fuse interface. So 